So before we skin this head, I'm going to go ahead and point out some features here. So of course we've got the ear here, the eye here, and the horns. Okay. If we come over here to the nose, we can see that they do have a philtrum, unlike the ox who has what's called a planum nasal labialis, which is just a big plate. And then the nostrils are to each side, and it's very stiff. They have a planum labialis, which is just this plate here that makes this upper lip stiff. But they still have a philtrum between the two nostrils. And notice there is a dental pad here. We don't have any upper incisors. We just have a dental pad. And there's the lower incisors. Looks like this animal has some deciduous teeth yet. You know? Okay. And so here once again are the horns. Notice that the horns are much more rostral than they would be in the ox. They'd be more coming off back caudally here. Okay, we'll look at a skeleton to see that in just a sec, but just behind the horn here I can palpate a structure which is actually the horn gland. Okay. Now let's go look at the skeleton. So here you can see how these corneal processes are much more rostral. And so this is all the frontal bone here. Okay, so let's go look at a ox now. You can see here how on the ox those corneal processes are much more caudally. Now just a few other features that because this is a preserved head and it's cold and a little stiff we can just kind of estimate where things are at okay so our nasal bones are here and back about in here on a live animal you can see a little notch which is the naso incisive notch so the incisive bone would be on this side nasal bone here so that's the naso incisive notch and you come down from that and right about here should be the infraorbital foramen where the infraorbital nerve comes out. Okay. And just ventral and a little bit caudal would be the facial tuberosity. And now if we come up to the eye, just above the eye here, above that medial canthus would be where the supraorbital foramen is or the frontal vein comes out. Now if we come from the medial canthus of the eye back to the horn we would need to inject about halfway here to get the infratrochlear nerve and then from the lateral canthus to the horn about halfway here to get the corneal nerve. Okay, And those would be the nerves that we would want to block if we were to do a dehorning. Okay? And we can also palpate the bony orbit around the eye. Okay, so the bony orbit, just like in the horse and the ox, we have a complete orbit here, totally enclosed by bone. So our zygomatic process of our frontal bone and our frontal process of the zygomatic bone are joining together here. And we can go back to the skeleton and have a look at that again. And we can see right here how we've got a complete bony orbit here. Okay? And then those other processes we looked at. So here's that nasoincisive notch. We've got just below it the infraorbital foramen, just above the medial canthus of the eye here, the supraorbital foramen, and here's that, that facial tuberosity. Before I continue on here, I just wanted to show you this very thin facial muscle here. Okay, in the dog we refer to this as the platysma. In the large animal, it's often referred to as the cutaneous fasciae muscle. Okay, 
So we're going to reflect that and isolate these other muscles here. Now if we look once again at those structures that we looked at when the skin was still on, we would find right about in, let's see, right about in here is that nasoincisive notch and then just ventral to it right about in here is going to be the infraorbital canal. The foramen is opening right there. We come just ventral and caudal to that and there's the facial tuberosity. We look here at the bony orbit and we can almost see that itself and so the zygomatic arch is coming through here and we've got the zygomatic process of the frontal bone joining the frontal process of the zygomatic bone here and then if we come up here right, uh, right about there that's where our supraorbital foramen and groove are and that's where the frontal vein is going to sit. Okay, we don't have our nerves dissected out yet, but we'll try to dissect out those a little later. So now we got these muscles cleaned up a bit. So here's our cutaneous fasciae muscle reflected down. Okay, now what we see here is the levator nasolabialis because it elevates both the nasal and the upper lip. Then we have here, this is the levator labii superioris. Its tendon comes down this way, so it elevates the lip that way. Then we have the caninus muscle. Then we have the depressor labii superioris because it's going to depress the upper lip. This muscle here coming off the zygomatic arch is the zygomaticus. This muscle in here is the bucinator muscle. Then we have this muscle coming along here, and that's going to be our depressor labii inferioris. Okay? We can see this muscle here. This is our mandibular portion of our sternocephalicus, and it comes up and doesn't attach on the mandible as it does in the ox, but it comes all the way up and attaches to the zygomatic arch. Okay, so here under the ear we can see the parotid salivary gland and this kind of lighter cluster right here I believe is the parotid lymph node. Okay, and just beneath that we can see the artery, vein, and nerve here. The artery is the transverse facial artery transverse facial vein and that nerve is going to be see it looks like we have two branches here but this branch here is going to be the dorsal buccal branch of the facial nerve this other one I believe is going to be part of the maxillary nerve okay that's going to be the auriculotemporal branch okay we follow this parotid salivary gland down. It's quite extensive in our ruminant. Here we can see coming out from it the parotid duct. And if we follow that parotid duct over, here it is again. And it's going to come over here and go into the lateral cheek. Okay. Running with that duct here, if we back up to the external jugular vein. We can see the vein not real well but here it's going to branch into the maxillary vein and the lingual facial. The facial vein is this vein right here. Okay so the facial vein is this and the parotid salivary duct run together. Also we see here the ventral branch of the or the ventral buccal branch of the facial nerve. Okay, so that's ventral buccal branch, this is dorsal buccal branch. Those are both of the facial. We'll need to dissect a little deeper up here to see the auriculo 
palpebral branch, which is going to go to the ear and to the eye. If we, if we follow our facial vein here, notice we don't have a facial artery in these guys. Our transverse facial is going to be our main arterial supply. But our facial vein is going to come up and it's going to give off our lateral nasal, our dorsal nasal, and then our angularis oculi up here. Okay, let's see. Did I miss anything here? Well, we got orbicularis oris muscle here. Orbicularis oculi muscle is here. I think we cut away some of it by accident, but that's going to encircle the eye. And then we have the frontalis muscle up here in front. <laughs> okay, let's come down here a little bit. And we can see here mandibular salivary gland, mandibular lymph nodes. And back here, right up adjacent to the junction of our larynx and our trachea, is going to be our thyroid gland. Okay, so to review these muscles down in here, here is the other portion of the sternocephalicus, which is the mastoid portion, and then we've got this guy here is going to be the omohyoideus. Here we're going to see it joining with the sternohyoideus and then this guy up here coming up to the thyroid cartilage is the sternothyroideus. Okay also down in here next to our thyroid gland I believe this may be our cranial deep cervical lymph node because usually it's found near our thyroid gland and we can see our external carotid artery running up here and we should have the vagosympathetic trunk up in here. There it is. There's our vagosympathetic trunk running with it. And we'll be able to see the branches a little bit better after we do a transection of the head. And if we look up here, so our muscles of mastication, all that we can see now, we can see a little bit of the masseter muscle sitting up under here. We have our bucinator muscle, which is actually not mastication, but it helps keep the food over onto the teeth. And we can see a little bit here of our digastricus muscle, which is our only muscle for closing. Okay, Our temporalis muscle is going to be sitting up here in the temporal fossa. And we won't see our pterygoids until we open up the head. But let me bring you over here so that temporalis muscle is going to be sitting up in here, ventral to the horn. So that's a little hard to get at because the ear is sitting right here now too. Okay. And also here, ventral to the eye, we have the malaris muscle. Sometimes this more caudal portion in the small ruminants referred to as the depressor palpebrae inferioris. Okay.